So, good afternoon. Let me see. Oh yeah, it's exactly time to go. So, lecture number 11. Lecture number 11, so, um, oh yeah, I know that you will be you're very surprised. I have a green screen. Yeah, yeah, and this is this is how it look when you become to be a professional YouTube produce producer. I don't know what they are called, but you know, <clears throat> I'm very happy. I'm very happy. It's not just at the green screen, but it's a lightning system too, so it looks very nice. But still, one technical problem, and the my final technical problem is the fact that I'm still using my old camera. I mean, that the camera is, which is not the best possible quality. And that um, uh, is a little bit of problem because it freezes every now and then. So if it freezes, please let me know. So I will uh, do something in that regard. Okay, let me, I want to see your comments. I want to see your comments. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it will be. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I like that I'm a figure from the future. And also, you know, the screen t-shirt would be also outstanding that's that's another thing that's a thing that i didn't really consider you know a cream hoodie you know then it would be just my head oh that's that's a great idea okay now should we go to real deal lecture number 11 lecture number 11. Uh, so what, what's going to happen today is that we need to close the case about the hydraulics. So we still have a, <clears throat> two matters to discuss about the hydraulics. And uh, those two matters are model of cylinder and model of a pump. And once we have those two components, so these two guys, oh, look at this. So the drawing is, oh, there is still some technical things because the drawing seems not to cooperate today. Cylinder and the pump. Why is that my my pen don't like to make any drawings? All right, so I need to use my alternative pen. This guy, that's my alternative pen. Okay, thanks God we have no equations to write today because you know it will be very very unclear to write with my finger. Okay, so once we're done with these final components, then we're gonna make a Example about the hydraulics. So we're going to look how is that we can model the hydraulic circuit, simple hydraulic circuit, but still it's uh, something that you can extend to more complicated hydraulic circuits. The idea will be all the time same. And then, uh, then once we're done with the hydraulics, then the last technical item, really the last technical item in this course is a flexible bodies. We are not going to discuss about the static analysis because that's going to be a very simple thing and is a little bit of waste of time for us because we are looking at the dynamics, dynamics instead of the statics. Uh, so that's what we're going to skip. And if I'm not correct, there is a little bit of explanation about um, static analysis in Lexanode. If not, you can just skip it. Uh, anyway, so um, flexible bodies will be the last technical thing. And then what will happen, what, what, what going to happen in the last lecture, which is a lecture ID 12? Well, then we're going to discuss about, you know, how is the, what, what it means if we are able to synchronize the solution of, of uh, multi-body system dynamics to real time? And what, are, what are the benefits if, if capable to do so? So the last lecture will be in that subject matter. That's by the way, if you wanted to pick the one lecture that is good, it's definitely that one. So it's very entertaining. I think it is a little bit of eye-opening experience because it makes you think hopefully a little bit of a different way. So make sure that you're able to participate that lecture on um, Monday, next Monday. And then depending how things going on on, on Monday, there, there is possibly uh, one more lecture, which is a lecture ID 13. And the reason being that um, I still want to give this summary, the summary of the items that I'm expecting you to know when you are going to next uh, midterm exam. So that's a little hard to predict, but if going as planned, then uh, there is going to be uh, 
one more lecture after the next week lecture. And uh, then I still need to set up this um, uh, boating action to figure it out when the exam could be organized because I would like to I would like to change the exam timing a little bit such that the time the exam next second midterm exam is right after when all the lectures are done so then uh, you can put your attention to other courses and you are you can put some energy to finalize the simulation assignment which is mandatory item okay quite a bit of discussion so um, let's move on so let's move on to how is the hydraulics so last week we started by explaining first about the different flow types and we concluded that there are two different flow types one that is very frequent and one that is not very frequent and the one that is not very frequent is a laminar flow and a laminar flow something that is important you to see here is how is the relation between the flow rate and the pressure difference and a laminar flow that relation is always linear and it depends on the the geometry of the throttle it depends on the the viscosity and uh, and this kind of components can be put it together to one coefficient that is here denoted as a cl cl is very heavily case dependent but important thing here is that flow rate and the pressure difference are linear related that's something that you must keep it in your mind and now when uh uh, yeah, I see that my camera is still okay because I was looking that mine was already frozen. Okay, anyway, so then the more frequently type or more usual type of flow is turbulent flow. And in a turbulent flow, the important thing is that relation between the pressure difference and the flow rate is quadratic. That's something that is extremely important to understand. And remember, that in the case of laminar flow, when we are looking at the flow particles, how they are traveling, in a laminar flow, they're traveling with the good smooth paths like this, whereas in the turbulent flow, there is a rolling, it's like motion like this, so it's non smooth. I mean, it's still smooth, but it's a little bit of rolling back and forth. So that's a turbulent flow. Then we also apply this technique of modeling um, um, flows and pressure differences to different uh, components. So we apply those first to throttle valve, and we learned a little bit about how is a semi-recursive, excuse me, semi-empirical um, modeling approach. And in semi-empirical modeling approach, which this is, by the way, something that is very frequently asked in, uh, in midterm exams, idea is that you get started from analytical equation. And then you're manipulating or modifying your analytical equation such that all necessary parameters can be obtained from symbol measurements. And these symbol measurements are typically obtained or provided in manufacturer's catalog. Here's a good example. So this is a throttle valve. And a throttle valve parameters needed are these ones here. I mean, they're there somewhat easy to, to obtain in this symbol valve. But as soon as the valves becomes to be more complicated, they are increasingly difficult to get. And that's why it makes sense to use a method where we are replacing all these analytical parameters by parameters that you can obtain from the mesons. In this case, the parameter is simply called CV, and that's our semi-empirical parameter. It's exactly the one, so we don't exactly the one that is based on analytical expression. So we don't lose anything here. It's just expressing things in a little bit of different ways. All right, so that was about the total valve. We also look a little bit about direction valve. And in a direction valve, the first thing to do is that we need to figure it out where is the spool position. And here we're making a model where the spool is um, magnetically actuated and the spool follows the input signal with a certain delay. That delay is expressed by this first order differential equation. And now, depending how is the spool position, we have three different scenarios. So if it is positive direction, then the, this is the flows. So it's connecting the ports P and A and tank and B. And if it is in the middle position, then we are assuming that there is no flow rate whatsoever. And then if it is negative, then uh, it is assumed that the A is connected to tank 
and being disconnected to pump. So that's how it goes. Now here's another important thing which is valid for this model only. Here we assume that the valve opening and the flow rate is having a linear relation. This is sometimes the case but it's not necessarily the case and what I mean is a valve opening which is physically described by this equation here so the u and then the flow rate how those are related and in our case they are linear related they could be proportionally related and then it's going to be something like this and there's a many different scenarios how they could be related okay so with that just a few observations this is like general observation and this is a kind of the two slides that I wanted to show a little bit about, you know, what are the significant develops and developments in the mobile machinery. Here is a mobile machine from ancient time. I don't know when this was manufactured, but this is definitely not that the latest model. And then this is the latest model. So this is how they look. Now, if you look a little bit about carefully, like how are the mechanical solutions? Well, they've been improved. You know, a certain extent, and you know, it's a look a little bit different, but still, it's hydraulically actuated, which is important. So, the actuation, a means of actuation, is, is not changed. Uh, the four bar mechanisms, which is used here, they're having a little bit of different geometry, but the concept is still more or less same. And you know, this cylinder is connected in a little bit different location in a modern system. But basically, the solution, mechanical solutions, are not that significantly different, even though that the difference in time-wise, I think it is maybe 15 years between these two figures. It's so what being changed. Eh? So what is a significant change? Significant change is this. You know, this is how the capping look a while ago, and this is how they look at the moment. And that's a great, dif great difference. You know, here, look at these sticks. You know, these sticks are operating the valves, and the valves are located right here. So I don't know if it is clear, maybe I should change the color a little bit. So the valves are here. And it's, you know, it's just looking very, very nasty. Here, the way you operate the hydraulic is based on the joystick. So joysticks that are located here, it's, it's they send in the single direction valve, hydraulic device is doing more or less the same. But this is where the most of the significant change is being made. And uh, this is where we're getting back when we are discussing about real-time simulation. Shortly, just a, a little bit of like uh, to make you attracted about the topic. You know, here, the, what is very much in the, in the focus is that how is the user experience. This time, the user experience, they didn't really care about that. So how is that the multi-body system dynamics? computational dynamics can be used to improve the user experience. That's where the multi, this, that's where the real-time simulation comes into play. And it's going to be one exciting story that you will hear on Monday, next Monday. Okay, so let's move on. Yeah, digital hydraulics. So that, that um, I was unable to play the, the YouTube video, but I was expecting you to do it. And... Uh, <clears throat> Then, uh, so uh, is that, so there's a comment, is the line broken as to, uh, I don't know what that really refers to, you know, the line broken as to model and overlook, or outlook, I don't know what that is. Anyways, let, let me continue with the digital hydraulics. Uh, the idea of the digital hydraulics is very simple. So in conventional or traditional hydraulics, let me put it this way. Uh, now, the idea is that we have a spool and the spool can move without any jumps smoothly from one location to another location. And when it's doing the motion, then we either have these three operation and condition and within these operation and condition, we can increase the flow. So it's, there is no limit how to do it. In digital hydraulics, the concept is very, very different. In digital hydraulics, we have a number of on-off valves. And these on-off valves may have a different sizes. And now these valves here, four different on-off valves, different sizes, can be opened and closed using the digital hydraulics control scheme. 
and they kind of introducing the same concept that moving the spool back and forth. You know, why it makes sense to do it? Well, it makes sense to do it because, you know, this is something that you can have more energy efficient solution. And uh, the reason really is that if you're capable to do this digital on off control, even in your pump and in your valves are part of the game, that makes it possible to have a significant changes or savings in, in energy consumption. And energy consumption, as we all know, this time is, is very, very important and critical thing. So in digital hydraulics, the spool is replaced by number of on-off valves. That's what it is. So um, now I get, I know I got the, the problem in a model and overlook is something that there's a, some kind of um, software problem in, uh, I suppose that this is in a student affairs office. I suppose so. At least I'm not aware of any of any of this stuff. And well, I haven't been in a model lately, so maybe there is a problem in a model. Okay. Anyway, so let's move on, and let's have a first in class quiz for today, and it's this one: digital direction valve consists of. And the choices are: a spool controlled by a computer, a number of on-off valves spool controlled by a magnet, a spool that moves incrementally. So the one is correct, which is correct. So let me put it on, hold on. My mouse is here, let me see here. And it's on. Okay, I see that uh, I, I'm a little bit of worried because you know there's a really alarming number and the alarming number is the number of students. So it seems that we only have 50 students today. That's not good. Oh, actually we have, I think we have more because uh, when I'm looking at the streaming window, okay, I get um, 70, 70 viewers. That's, that's much better, way much better. And the game is on, of course. So, uh, so the guesses, lottery, lottery guesses, shoot it. And some people are already thinking that it's going to be 100%. Maybe we'll see that in a second. Uh, I, I kind of, uh, my personal guess is this, 82. 82, simply because, I, you know, I, I have some assets that you don't. And that the kind of the information I have that you don't is that I see how many people comes in, you know, just momentarily, just a few minutes back. And I noticed that there were at least, I think, five students that just came in. Those those five students, they have no idea what is a correct solution. So, so that's why I'm not thinking that it's 100%. But anyways, so we'll see. So we have 67 students, 45 and the answer. Okay, so momentarily we are ready to continue. <clears throat> okay. What else? Well, I'm, I'm happy to see that the camera is cooperating. I made some ex trial trials earlier today, and it was freezing all the time. So it was really, really annoying. So I have a I have a backup system, but it's not on yet. And the backup system is outstanding. Is this one? Let me show it to you. That's what I'm planning to use next Monday. GoPro. GoPro. So. It just needs some special cables to be able to connect this to my computer, which of course I don't have it today. So that's why I'm using that whole camera. Oh, so uh, let me see the situation. So we, um, we have five students that are not yet sure what is a correct answer. Momentarily, I will go and let me see a look at the time. Okay, I guess that would time wise we're doing okay. Okay. The one thing that I don't know, what is a chat grade? Is that like percentage of participants that are saying something in a chat? I don't know. Really don't know that. Okay. We have three students that are not sure. Rest are sure. 
Oh yeah, by the way, I have to say that this new system is so much better because I have so much more room to play these other windows. So this is significant improvement. And the lightning system, you should see how is my home office. It's like pretty much like here, you know, being in a beach in a summertime. A lot of lights here. Okay, but uh, one more, one student is still thinking. And uh, let me see. So let me do the counting. In five, in four. Oh, yeah, now we have it all. Okay, success rate. Competition is done. So uh, my guess was 80. Let me check my, my guess. 82. So let's see if I'm the winner or somebody else. So the success rate today is, look at me. So I was, you know, I was kind of right about this. So I, I thought that, uh, um, uh, so it's something quite low, surprisingly low. Even though that I just repeat the answer a number of times before the in-class quiz, but still, it's so difficult to keep, to put your attention to me all the time. It's hour and a half lecture. So it's, it's a lot to ask. Okay, so we've got 66. So do we have a winner today? Uh, no, no, I don't think we have a winner because you know you guys are guessing the numbers that are way too high. Oh yeah, way too high. The lowest that I'm able to find is 78. 70, oh, 76, we have 76 here. Uh, yeah, another 76. But you guys are way off, way off. I was off too. But anyway, so let me see. Maybe it's just that, you know, it's becomes to be, it's a Monday. Yeah, it's Monday. That's what explains it. Or maybe, maybe you're so shocked about my green screen on my new system. That could, that could explain it as well. Okay, Sulinger, finally. Let's look at the cylinder and let's look at the pump momentarily. I don't think we need to spend that much time on these two, two subject matters. Okay, so cylinder is first. Cylinder is very simple component. There is, however, one kind of a detail that makes it harder to deal with. And the detail that makes it a little bit harder to deal with is the friction. And the friction that takes a place because of the ceilings. You know, you have to have a ceilings in hydraulic systems to make sure that, you know, that first of all, the oil is not getting off uh, from uh, the cylinder. So there have to be ceiling here, you know, here where there is a, a piston rod uh, is actually moving back and forth. So this is sealed. So that's the way that the oil stays within the cylinder. So there have to be ceilings here in the, in the piston as well to make sure that the, the, the oil is not traveling here to here. I mean, one chamber to another chamber. So that's where you need a, a ceilings as well. Now the ceilings is a little bit of nasty component. And the reason being that um, because of the ceilings, the friction is a function of number of different details. And actually, it's a number of so many different details that it's almost impossible to make very, very accurate model about the friction. But there are some ways that we can kind of cut the corners a little bit and make acceptable friction model. Now, friction is the difficult component. Symbol components, in turn, are the most significant ones. And the most significant ones are pressure multiplied by a corresponding cross-section area. And that's where the hydraulic cylinder operates. So I have a pressure P1 here that is applying this particular cross-section. Pressure multiplied by the cross-section, that's going to be the force that is pushing uh, piston to right-hand side. Then there is a pressure 2 that is applying here in this cross-section, which is exactly the same than previous one minus the, the rod diameter and the corresponding cross-section of the rod, rod. And that's going to be the minus in the size. You know, these are the ones that are very significant. 95% of the forces is because of these two components. 95%, maybe even more than that. Now, um, then 
this car is the only one that is a little bit of difficult, but let's look at the ways we can model that big nasty component. Um, as mentioned earlier, uh, it, if you really want to take a look, and if you really want to make a very accurate model about the friction force in the hydraulic cylinder, you should take many things into account, such like uh, what's the direction you're traveling? Are you traveling left or right? That changes the, the friction a little bit. Pressure difference between the chambers, the pressure levels in general, they, that affects quite a bit. And then uh, standing times, uh, seal types, duration of motion and that kind of things. All that becomes to be so complicated that there's no way to, to take those into account in a, in a reasonable manner. So the way this is predicted in, in practical modeling is that we are making assumption about the hydraulic cylinder efficiency. And efficiency is something that is usually very high. So we can assume that this is efficiency, which is, by the way, a little bit confusing notation as it is being uh, used also for uh, viscosity. But try to keep these two things away from each other. So here I'm referring efficiency. And efficiency, the number wise. Okay, so I got the message that my voice is duplicated. How come? So there's an echo of some kind. Hmm. There shouldn't be any echo because I'm only using this headset, and that's about it. Uh, okay, so it's better now. Okay. I don't know. Yeah, another thing, another improvement that is not yet here is that I ordered the new headset to me. Because this headset is kind of dying. I've been wearing them. I mean, my very on daily basis, so I'm pretty much all day long. So they're about to die. So I've got to get the new headset too, but it's, I don't have it yet. So hopefully all the final settings is here next Monday when we're about to close the course. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Of course, I made a mistake. I should have everything ready prior to that. But anyways, so efficiency. Uh, let me see, I need to move a little bit this direction to make sure that you see my slide. Okay, efficiency number-wise, you may use a number which is um, 0 0.96, 0 0.95, so it's fairly high. And then there is a how much force, kind of like uh, force without the friction is produced by a cylinder. That's the really the great factor. And then there's a curve fitting. And the curve fitting is something that is made based on the measurements. And this is a good example about the, how the measurements look like. Well, let's take a look at this, this figure. And let me see if I can make this a bit bigger. I guess that I cannot do that easily. Let me see. Yeah, I can make it a bit bigger. So here it is. Now let me go back to the drawings. OK, so what I have here is that, first of all, this is uh, sliding velocity. So what is a velocity of piston? And then this is a friction. And as you see, this is written even in finish. This is a little bit old material. But anyway, so content, I'm sure that you understand this. Now, different curves represent the different uh, force produced by cylinder. And now you can see something quite interesting here that, you know, when uh, there is a significant force produced by cylinder, you know, the curve when it's approaching to very low velocity, it started to increase rapidly. And, uh, you know, this is the kind of the curve that we can kind of use a curve fitting technique and make it like this. And just when it is very, very close to zero, we are moving, we are kind of forcing it to go through the ori origin, and then it's going to be the mirror in the other side. This is the curve that we can use to kind of replicate the friction. There are methods to describe the friction as a non-continuous function, non-smooth function. And in a non-smooth function, the curve actually ends here. And then if the motion continues another side, it jumps directly here. That needs some special treatment, numerical treatment, because um, 
in all the simulation, all the functions should be smooth. Otherwise, you end up to have a serious numerical difficulties. Uh, now, this is interesting because, you know, look at this curve when there is a very small velocity. When you start it from the rest and when you're moving a little bit, when you're increasing the speed a little bit, then the friction goes downwards like this. And then uh, when you increase it, the velocity, it goes up again. This is typical scenario which leads to a situation called stick slip friction. And this slip friction is something you see a lot in your real life. It's something that, you know, system is sliding and then sticking, sliding and sticking, sliding and sticking. That's what you can hear when you're pushing, for example, your furniture from different locations in your living room. You hear this kind of noise, like this kind of uh, small noise, which uh, is due to the fact that the you know, components are standing and sliding, standing and sliding, and that's what causes it. Let me see if I can make any demonstration here. Not really. Yeah, sorry, no demonstration today, but I'm sure you know what I'm meaning. Because it's a kind of, you hear this like a minor, like um, um, almost like a bangs when things are sticking and when they're sliding again. And this is very, very typical and takes a place often in the hydraulic cylinders. Uh, okay, let me go back. Let me take this. Uh, oh, so we here. Okay, so that one can be modeled by using this curve fitting technique. So curve fitting is a key for success. Okay, but that was about the cylinder. So it's that simple. So not much to discuss about the cylinder. A little bit about to discuss about the pump itself. Pump, again, sometimes it can be modeled as a constant pressure source. And if you do so, that is very, very straightforward. You're just assuming that pump is capable to produce the constant pressure no matter what. That's not necessarily the case in reality because, you know, the pumps are usually reacting to changes in a in a power needs, and maybe there's certain drops in a pressure uh, distribution or this uh, when they're providing the pressure. But anyways, let's look at what are the pump models. And then we're done with the hydraulics. One more example, and then we're done. Okay, pump models, modeling wise. This is extremely important. So modeling wise, we always assuming that the pump is producing the flow rate, flow rate. This is a little bit like egg in the chicken situation because, you know, is it the pressure or flow rate? It's flow rate. And the pressure takes a place when you hold on now. I need to figure it out how to make it drawings here. Here. Okay. So it's a flow rate. Pressure takes a place when you're restricting the flow rate. When you are not allowing the flow to travel freely, then the pressure started to increase. And that's exactly what we have in our first order differential equation. Remember, we have these P dots. So how is a P? So it was a effective bulk modulus divided by volume, flow rate in, flow rate out. And then this one component that we don't need to worry about that. So if the incoming flow is increasing, or is bigger than outgoing flow, pressure started to increase. This tangents is getting higher. So it's kind of like some of the velocity. Velocity is getting bigger. And when velocity is getting bigger, the pressure is getting bigger. Okay. Pressure is kind of like a position. Same concept. Okay. But we are looking at how the flow rate is produced. A pump is making that happen. Okay. So uh, how we can make it happen? Well, that really depends on the pump types. And we have two different pumps types and type wise. We have fixed volume pumps, which is producing the flow rate no matter what. So they keep on producing the flow. Is it, is it needed or not? That They don't really care about that. And then there's a little bit more and more smart pump types, which are variable volume pumps. And as the title implies, variable volume pumps, they are varying their flow rate. So they are capable to see when the energy is needed in the system and when it is not needed. And then there's a wide variety of different uh, ways how this control, this 
flow control can be accomplished. It could be something like very simple, like how is a pressure right after the pump, and the pump is making sure that that pressure remains approximately constant. Or it can be more clever, like load sensing pumps, which are sensing the loads close to different actuators. And when they're sensing the loads in different actuators, they're always ready to produce enough, I mean, additional energy, whatever that is needed. So, but anyway, so let's first take a look at about a little bit about how is a mechanical construction. That's almost like irrelevant because we, hold on, I need to figure it out how to make this picture right like this. Um, okay, it's okay. So back to my drawing here. Okay, so these are the different mechanical structures you can find with, inside of the pumps. Most often, clearly the most often one uses the piston pumps, piston pumps. And now I mentioned earlier about this digital pumps. Uh, the, really the big dream in hydraulics would be to decide whether or not the piston pumps are producing energy to the system or not. And this could be decided by based on these simple valves here. So you can actually control that. So are you really putting this, the, the, the flow to system or are you just putting that back to the tank? And this is something that can have a great potential in terms of energy efficiency. I'm not sure if there's any clear uh, practical applications yet. I, I, I suppose that I should call my friends to Tampere University and ask how well is uh, digitally controlled pumps doing. But I met them, I think like five years back, and they said that it's looking very promising. I haven't heard since that, so, but I'm expecting that it's getting more or less great. Okay, but uh, models, we care about the models. Okay, what about the fixed volume pumps? How is that you can model that? Well, the fixed volume pumps is very simple. We're going to use the you know, most convenient, the most simple equation we know. So we basically are looking at how is a power, power associated to hydraulics. The power associated to hydraulics is simply flow multiplied by pressure. And now, because the pump is operated by motor with a certain power limit, this is going to be our equation. We simply use this equation with taking efficiency into account, and that's about it. So it's very straightforward. There is, however, another factor that must be accounted. Another factor that must be accounted is that, uh, of course, there is a maximum flow rate that the, pulp, uh, that the pump can produce, and that's coming simply from the geometry of the pump. Now, using this pressure equation and physical limitations, you have two equations. So the one that is based on power, another one that is based on the physical limitations, and you compute both. And then you're selecting the one that is giving you the lower value. And then you will use that one in your equation. And it's very simple. Usually this is the one that is dominating, but you know it's always possible that you can produce I mean, that's sometimes possible that the flow rate is uh, restricted because of the, the dimensions. And if that's the case, then the second one is the limiting factor. That's about it. So it's simple, no further consideration is needed to making a pump about the fixed volume. How about um, this variable volumes? Now that depends heavily what kind of scenario you're using in your controlling scheme. And now today when I'm using my finger to make the drawings, it may be a little bit of challenging to make a good quality drawing, but we'll do my best. Okay, the first uh, kind of the scheme that is used in the variable volume pumps is a constant pressure control. Constant pressure control is very simple and it works like this. So let me see if I have this pen. No, not willing to do it. Okay, hold on, maybe there's a trick that I can do. Because this is a USB-C connected, so maybe I can use USB-C to wreck this up. Yep, 
Okay, let me see. Oh my God. Look at this. So what is this? I become to be like really an expert in computers. I'm getting wrong with the computers really well. Quite amazing, quite amazing. So now let's just take this off, what I just made. This one off. Okay. And let me explain the constant pressure control to you. So the constant pressure control is like this. Let me take this off. So you have here a pump. Uh, still is not that easy to make a high quality. Uh, so this is this this arrow shouldn't. Let me just get started from the beginning. Okay. So this is your drawing symbol for the pump. This means variable volume, and then uh, this is the line just goes off from the pump. And now what you're going to do is that you're going to have here a pilot line. You're kind of measuring, you're sensing the pressure here right after the pump. And this is what you're using to tune your flow rate. So the flow rate is depending how is a pressure here. And it is simple equation. It's just a simple control scheme. So you have uh, pressure that you are sensing, this one here. And then you have a set pressure, the pressure that you would hope that pressure to be. It's this one here. Let's say that you hope that the pressure to be 260 bar. And if it is not that much, then you say to your pump, make sure that you're producing enough flow that the pressure here is 250 bar. If it is 250 bar, then it's okay. So you don't need any additional flow rate. Then you can tell your pump that, okay, that's enough. Don't produce any more flow rate. So this is the equation that tells how the flow rate can be modeled. Now look at this. The flow rate is here, the Q dot. So this is a differential equation. So it's a differential equation that kind of introducing a little bit of delay. And it's needed because the pump are unable to react instantaneously to changes of the pressure needs. So there is always a certain delay. How much delay? Well, that depends on the mechanical structure of the pump. But that delay is accounted by this time constant here. It's a similar kind of parameter or model in general that we use in the case of um, spool position. So that too was unable to jump from one location to another. Here too, so the pump has a certain delay. Uh, that's because of the, the mechanical structure. Okay, so the more sophisticated control scheme is a load sensing, which I'm briefly explaining to you. And then I'm expecting you to look at the YouTube video that I have a link in my next slide. So in a load sensing control, the idea is that you're measuring, well, let me let me try to, to make more symbols here. So you have here several different actuators, hydraulic cylinders. You're measuring the pressures in different locations close to these cylinders. Uh, these are the pilot drillings. So kind of like similar than this one, you take them in a one location, all of them. I'm sorry, that is a little bit of messy. And then you're selecting the lowest one out of, from the, of many measurements. And then, then once you have that the lowest one, oh, this says actually the maximum one. So the highest one, the highest one. I think that is the lowest one. Uh, this say max, maximum out of from the many places. I think it is a minimum. I need to check that. I need to get back to you. I need to confirm that to you next uh, Monday. Okay, so anyway, so the same idea than measuring here, but this time you're measuring that from many locations. All of these locations are closed to actuators. And then you're selecting the one, which is, in my mind, the lowest one. This, although it says that the maximum one. Anyways, so that's the one that you're using to tune your system. So make sure that the pressure that is available in the cylinder is always, you know, close to something that is a little bit more that is needed. How it goes in details, please take a look at this outstanding YouTube site, which is this one here. So I could try to, no, I'm not going to play it to you. So you need to look at it by yourself right after this uh, lecture. And make sure you look at that because uh, the questions that I'm easily asking in hydrology is like, how is that? Digital hydraulics, 
and how is uh, load sensing pumps, how you can model the load sensing pumps. What's the operation principle of uh, load sensing pumps? And with that, you know, this is a load sensing control. A little bit about how is the symbols here. So you're measuring here, and you're measuring here, and then that's, this is the one that is going to the, the pump and giving the signal how the pump should be controlled. But take a look at this uh, this YouTube, and it becomes clear to you immediately. It's very good. It's good stuff. Okay, this parameter that is needed that you can get again from the characteristic curves, but uh, usually they, they range with a certain uh, um, number wise in a certain uh, very close area. So it's somewhat easy to pick that. And uh, again, it can be obtained from the manufacturer's catalog. Okay, hydraulic model. In hydraulic model, the pump is assumed to produce what? Pressure for hydraulic circuit. Uh, let me put it on. Let me put it on so you can already take a look. How is it? Okay, it's so a pressure for hydraulic circuit. Oil flow, flow rate for hydraulic circuit. Temperature for hydraulic circuit. Volts to electric circuit. What is correct one? Only one is correct. So, uh, game is on. Let me see if you're still there. Oh yeah, it's already five o'clock. I'm somehow I'm a little bit slow today. I might slow all the time. Get that could be the case as well. Could be. Anyway, so uh yeah, I see that. <laughs> I'm slow all the time. Yeah, okay. I I wanna well, I'm gonna speed up a little bit. I'm gonna go the example, go through the example with good reasonable speed. Not going back and forth too much time. Okay, so game is on. So, let me see. I'm gonna come back to this in class quiz as, as I promised. I still have quite a bit of slides to cover today. Some of them are quite interesting. All of them are interesting, I would say. So what I would like to do next is that I would like to show you how is that you can create the all necessary equations that are needed to estimate how much force is produced by this hydraulic cylinder. This guy here. This is the one we need in a multi-body model. So basically this is the ultimate reason we do it, because we would like to know how much is the force that is applying the mechanism and how much is the actuator, because if you don't know that, you know, it's not making much of a sense to make very sophisticated and detailed multi-body model. Okay, so how it goes then? Here we are, by the way, we assume that there is no pump here, but there is a uh, constant pressure source, and then this one is a tank here. And, you know, we're making a model when the direction valve is assumed to be in this particular direction. So, so there's a quite a bit of assumptions. Um, I think we have... 89 answers, so we still uh, oh, we have 51 answers, so with 22 students are not sure what to answer. So let me just put this back for a few seconds so you know that there is an in-class squeeze going on. This one, in hydraulic model, a pump is assumed to produce what? Pressure, flow, temperature, voltage, in brief. And Seems that you kind of lost your self confidence because no one is voting 100% anymore. I am. I am. I'm voting 100%. 100% success rate. That's my, that's my uh, lottery. So now there is a core problem again. How come? Hmm. So maybe this is, yeah, maybe because of the 100%. I don't know. Hmm, that's weird. Because the only really the audio source that I'm using is this headset. So maybe the headset is breaking down. Others oh, seems not to hear it. So maybe it's a connection thing. Okay, but I'm gonna move on to my example. 
and I will get, oh yeah, I see that we only have six students that are still thinking, so momentarily we're able to go back to uh, in class quiz. So how it goes, what are the steps? So again, I wanna follow the certain steps. And once I'm done with the steps, I automatically have the equations that are needed to make an estimate about the force produced by this hydraulic sheet. First step, very, very critical. And this is discretization. This is a making decision where the pressure needs to be computed. And uh, once you do this, then you either make a good model or not. So it's kind of something that uh, for sure you need a little bit of engineering sense, not common sense, but the engineering sense to figure it out how you should divide your hydraulic circuit to make sure that you can compute the pressure correctly. Here, I'm making the pressure computing in this volume because there's a throttle valve here, which for sure introduced a certain amount of pressure losses. And then I have your direction valve, which too will introduce a certain amount of pressure losses. So it's, no, it's not the fair assumption to say that, you know, the constant pressure source and the pressure P1 are the same. For sure they're not. And that's simply because of the direction valve. And it's not the fair assumption to say that P1 and P2 are the same because there's a throttle between these two volumes. Okay. Then in a piston rod side, you know, then we have a P3, and that's about it. Another extremely important thing is that we have to make a decision about what is a positive flow direction. You can make it as yes you please. There is no really rules, but the one thing you need to make sure is that once you make your decision, then you need to be consistent. You cannot change the direction anymore. And the only way to be consistent is that you have to have this kind of drawings. Okay, here I'm assuming that the flow that is leaving from the direction valve is having the positive value. The flow this direct direction is a positive value and the flow this direction is a positive value. And that's needed because the next we're gonna make a differential equations and in this differential equations, you have to select is it incoming or outgoing flow rate. That's what it is needed. Okay, so we see that in class quiz is still on. So four students are not sure what to answer. Okay, step number two, equations for volumes. Very simple. This volume here is only the hose that is connecting these two components. Second one is a hose plus where is a piston traveling. So it's an X, which is measuring how far off is a piston from the bottom of the cylinder. And the same information is, well, I know that this is a little bit confusing. So X2 is supposed to be, X2 is supposed to be H minus X1. So that's that's the one that is used here. And that's it. So that's, we're done with the step number two. Step number three is effective bulk models. Effective bulk models as we have learned how to do it. So in effective bulk models, we simply, well, taking the, the flexibility of fluid into account, and the flexibility of the containers into account. This is the flexibility, or this is how you can, can compare the flexibility of first, second, and third volumes. That's about it. Then the most difficult, clearly the most difficult is the forming this differential equation. P2, let's get started from that. This flow rate, obviously is coming in, it's coming in. So it must have positive value. When the piston is traveling the positive direction, which is upwards, it's taking the volume off. So this has to be minus sign here, like this. And then uh, key three is almost the same thing. Now the piston, you know, X2 again is computed this way, as mentioned previously. And then the flow rate here is leaving. So that's why it is negative. But what about the one that is this guy here? How you would model that particular differential equation? How you would select the differential equation from, the, from these ones? And now for some reason, the dots are missing here. So it should be dots, of course. Okay, but let's go to our in-class quiz and see how was, uh, okay, why is that? Oh yeah, yeah, I'm in the wrong window. So here, 
now I'm in a right window. Okay, so we have two students that are not sure what is the correct answer for the first one. What is that the hydraulic pump is producing when we're looking at that from the modeling perspective? I'm gonna close this in a, well, I'm gonna close it right now. So the two ones are just too slow, too slow for us. But I still need to find where is my, my model stopping. Here, okay. So the game is on. Okay, look at this, 80, 80, so it's getting better. So it's kind of like, you know, you can do the math. So a couple more in-class quizzes and we're gonna hit 100% today. So 100% today, so let me see the wiener. Uh, we don't have a wieners. What we do? We do have a wieners. Yeah, it seems that the wiener come from uh, India. Um, okay, so if so, there is a question that I that I missed. So that if top interviewer, uh, in terms of practical terms, so what is the okay? So I don't know what what is that uh, is mentioned about this thing, but I, the question about uh, load sensing could be a little bit about. I guess if this is what you're asking, like how this could be in a written, I mean, second midterm exam, um, I would I would ask if I would be an interviewer, I would ask like why it makes sense to use a load sensing. What's the control procedure in the load sensing pumps? Hopefully that helps. So we got only one winner in this in class quiz. Yep. Yeah, only one winner. Okay. So let's move on. So this one here. So let's uh, let me take this off so you can see what are the choices. Okay. Now again, let me let me go back here. So I wanna I'm asking here like how this uh, differential equation that is associated to P1, how that should be computed. And then I have four different options. Only one is correct. And look at how they difference from each other. So the only difference is that how is a flow rate positive direction? So the, the effective bulk models and the volume size are always same. So no difference in that regard whatsoever. But flow rates, they either have a different and positive and negative directions. The one, the one that is supposed to be, that's that you have to pick from this figure. But looking at the figure and figuring it out by yourself. So what it is, what it is. So let me see. Maybe you already ended your answer. I think now that I need to keep this figure on a little while because otherwise it's so difficult to enter the answer. I have two students only, three students that ended the answer. Rest are still thinking. I think this is not so difficult. Just think what is a positive, what is a negative direction. Once you're done with that, then you can select the, the correct, uh, correct value. But it's all about flow rates. What is incoming and what is a leading flow rate? And now again, the, 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 you know, the game is on. Okay, so you wanna take these uh, red marks off. Sure. Yep, I think it's, maybe I should take these ones as well. Oh, yep, okay, now it's all clean, all clean. <laughs> so now, now you, your self-confidence is back. You're thinking that it's gonna be 100% again. Maybe it's going to be 100%, we'll see that. We'll see that soon. Okay, and then now you see that I'm uh, left to leap behind the schedule. So I don't know what's up with me. So too slow explaining things. Okay, so we have only 46 answers. 46, that's a very low. <clears throat> Just 
still 48. Maybe my hair is something that, well, maybe I should go like this so you can see it clearly how is the slide. How is an option C because my head is covering that. Okay, plugging the view. 50, 55, 55. Okay, so what do you guys say? 10 seconds. Just shoot it. Sometimes it's not helping to think too heavily. Just trust your feeling. And maybe it's going to be correct. And also statistically, you know, we only have four choices. So statistically, there's a 25% chance to hit it right. Okay, but what is the correct value? Let's take a look. Because I, I kind of need to show this to you because otherwise I'm unable to proceed in my example. So 68. Okay, so four students are still missing. So now I'm going to close the game. So the success rate today is, hmm, 67, 67. So it was a 67. That's a little bit low in my mind, a little bit low because, you know, what matters here? How are the arrows pointing here? You know, this one arrow is pointing towards the volume. So it's incoming flow rate. So it has to have a positive sign. This is where it is a positive and this is where it is positive. This is incorrect because it's negative as it is this one too. So what about the, this guy, this flow rate? He's leaving. So it's the one that is leaving. So it must be negative. So then we only have two choices here. So this is incorrect because it's coming. This is where it's leaving. Okay, and the wieners. So there is a, I guess that, uh, let me see. 67, oh yeah, we have a wiener, we have a wiener, we have a wiener, and the one wiener only, yeah, according to my math, one wiener, nice, okay, and with that, we're going to move on with this example, there's just a few more slides covered in the hydraulics. So here it is. So this is the, all the differential equations now with P. So the P is back here in the business, which is very good. And then uh, next one is uh, uh, what we need is um, uh, valves and flow rates. So we have direction valve here in this particular location and uh, how it can be modeled at uh, the flows. Well, the, that depends on the, the spool position. And these are the different scenarios for that. Total valve here, that's what we discussed earlier. So that's with the sign term here to make sure that we don't end up to have a negative value under the skew. And this is how you can model that the total valve here, the flow rate associated with that. And then if I speed up a bit, then the final thing is force produced by hydraulic solid. So B, the finally you are after P1 and P3, actually P2 and P3. And once you know these, then you know with 95% accuracy, what, how much force is produced by this hydraulic cylinder. Then if you really want to make a really sophisticated, very nice model, the final thing to do is to model the friction. Hmm. So with that, we close the hydraulics. So let me see if we have any comments. Oh, okay. I'm in the wrong place in my chat window. Okay. Flexible bodies is next. <laughs> master of hydraulics now. Yeah. Master of universe. You will be master of universe soon. But now and, uh, this time, so you have two things you're mastering. Multi-body system dynamics and modeling of hydraulics. Modeling of hydraulics, I think the, the level of knowledge you're going to get is very nice because with this you can use any commercial software. So uh, there are plenty of those. 
but we are not going to touch those uh, commercial softwares that deeply in this course. So that will be left to other courses, the one that are delivered by Professor Heike Andrews. Now we're going to look shortly about the flexible bodies. Now let me see. Um, we still have 25 minutes for a flexible bodies. That should be enough. It should be enough. But let me just uh, move my windows a little bit to make sure that I can see how is the streaming. Seems to be okay. It's okay. All right, flexible bodies. First of all, what makes sense to model deformable bodies? Well, bodies that are capable to deform? Uh, well, it makes sense because, you know, there are cases where the rigid body assumption is not capable to produce realistic representations. And there are cases like um, different kind of cranes that are deforming heavily. And the deformation is so significant is affecting the dynamic performance of the machine. And now if you model that as a rigid body, then um, your estimation or your prediction is with a poor accuracy. So aircraft wings is another example, like mentioned earlier. So, I mean, not earlier, but in the chat, if we say that. Helicopter plates, which, you know, it's a little bit of special case because they are having this uh, different characteristics depending when you are you flying or not. And, and then uh, many, many other examples. So basically the reason being that if you want to increase the accuracy of the model, then it makes sense to model certain bodies as a deformable bodies. But now comes the difficult question. Which ones should be deformable bodies? Well, that's a question that is impossible to answer. Uh, that just have to be based on your engineering sets. There are, when you look at the literature of flexible multi-body dynamics, every now and then there is a like rule of thumbs. Like people try to say some design rules when it makes sense to model deformable bodies. But seriously, there's no such thing. There's no such thing. It's so heavily case dependent that you cannot make any general rules when the body is supposed to be deformable and when it is okay to assume body to be rigid. So it's very heavily case dependent. But anyways, the field of flexible multibody dynamics, we have number of methods how to describe the flexibility. Actually, there is a here that just a few of them are listed, but there is a way much more than that. You know, there's a method where we are using rigid bodies in a certain way, lamp mass approach, which was the very frequently used method uh, say 20 years ago, it's not frequently used anymore because it's having some numerical difficulties and it's not um, uh, computationally very efficient. The one that is most often used at the moment is the one that is called floating frame of reference formulation. And that's where we are using modern reduction technique. So we kind of combine finite element method and um, multi-body system dynamics and the finite element model we use in modern reduction. That's what you learn from UC's open edge course. And you learn it from the course that is entitled as a simulation laboratory course, which, by the way, is outstanding course. So if you want to, uh, if you want to participate the outstanding course, something that is for sure very enjoyable, that's the one. That's definitely the one. So check that out and make sure you enroll that course. And then, of course, find a element. You know, finite element base, there's a many different varieties in finite element approaches. A finite element is a method, and as the title, title implies, is a method where we're using small elements. And these small elements are like piece of solution. And you keep on adding the piece of solution, you will get the entire solution. And that's what the finite element model modeling it is. And I think you have, you, you have seen a number of finite element models in your life because those are the ones that look like something that there is a structure. On top of the structure, there is a kind of like a fishing net. And that's a typical example about how the finite element models look like. We're not going to step into details of that modeling technique, but this is just for your information. Yeah, this is what I already explained. So, so mathematically, there is no such thing like rigid bodies. That's just urban work. 
it's like pretty much the same thing than the rotation of a particle. So it's not just here. But often we can make an acceptable assumption that the deformation is insignificant. And if it is insignificant, it is all right to model as a rigid body. But all the bodies in you know, theory are flexible bodies. But which one should be modeled as a flexible bodies? There is no way to know that. There's no way to know it. So you just need to use your common sense. Okay, a little bit about how is this field of flexible multibody dynamics? You know, the field of flexible multibody dynamics, roughly speaking, can be categorized to two different fields. And that is depending on how large deformation we are looking at. And that is defined how, by how is a relation between this displacement and strength. From the strength of material, you know that there is this, you know, strain and displacement relationship, and then there's of course, of course, strain and strain, excuse me, strain and stress relationship, which is more related to like how the, how is a material behavior, is a material behavior linear or nonlinear? But here we are first going to take a look at the how is a displacement strain relationship. Typically. Most often, we are assuming that this relation, which is, let me, let me make it clear for you, what, what is that I'm speaking about? You know, this displacement means when I'm measuring displacement in all location of the cantilever beam like this. So how is a U versus strain? How is this relation? Is this relation linear or nonlinear? And often, computational applications, we are assuming this relation to be linear. It's okay, and it's something you can uh, deal, and you can actually deal many structures by using this assumption. But it comes with the limitation. And the limitation is such that if you have a cantilever beam like this, and you have a force that is applying the free end of the cantilever beam, when you have this relation strain displacement relationship to be linear, then it means that the free end of the cantilever beam reminds in a loading line. That's shown here. You know, if you make a line here where the force is applied and how it is the original location of this cantilever beam and where it is the deformed location, it's there is no displacement in this axial longitudinal direction. This looks realistic, but if I keep on increasing the force, so it becomes to look unrealistic. And the reason being that if, you know, if the force is very large, soon the deformation look like this. You don't find this in the real life, because in the real life, what will happen is that there is a certain amount of axial direction deformation, like shown here. So in real life, this is what will happen. In order to capture this, you have to use nonlinear strain displacement relationship. This selection is so critical that we're speaking about the different methods, different kind of like approaches entirely. So if, um, so how can I get rid of this guy like this? Okay. Okay. Back here. So this decision about the linear or non-linear strain uh, displacement relationship is very critical because if you're selecting this one, then you can use the methods that where you use a modern reduction and so on and so forth. This one here is computationally extremely demanding, extremely demanding, but sometimes needed. Sometimes it is needed. Okay, what about this? You know, if there's a displacement, strain, and then there is one more step, stress. You know, you've been seeing this curves where there's a strain, stress relationship. And if you know the strain is small, this is a linear relation. And if it's, if it is large, then this is a nonlinear. This is where the plasticity, material plasticity, takes a place. Should we take that into account as well? Not really in a multi-body dynamics, because usually you know we deal with the methods, I mean the materials that are like steel materials. And if you have permanent deformation in your steel material, you know cranes or something. It's a so lazy design that you shouldn't even consider that. So the material nonlinearity is not usually accounted. So it's only this relation that is 
not linearly accounted. This one here doesn't really matter in our world, in our world. Other worlds is maybe a, maybe a making a big difference. Okay, so here is a two cantilever beams, one with a linear relation, another one with a nonlinear relation. And I guess you, you figure it out what is what. Of course, this coin, this is with a nonlinear relation because there's a little bit of axial deformation. And because of the axial deformation, the pendulum structure behaves different. Okay. Okay, what about the historical perspectives? Historical perspectives uh, and future perspectives as well. Uh, multi-body system started uh, with the rigid body, so it was initiated here. And then, um, say, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, it became clear that the assumption of rigid bodies is not enough. And it's important to increase the accuracy by, in the, by taking a deformation into account. And then the method based on the floating frame reference formulation was developed. And, uh, and then you can take the small deformation into account. The ones where the strain displacement relationship is linear. But you can deal with this, say, small deformation of connection out here. That's going to be OK. But then if you want to deal with the very large deformation, and say that you want to deal with the belt, that is definitely experiencing very large deformation because it's like this, then you cannot use this method anymore, but you need to jump the other methods. The one that is sometimes used, one option is called the floating, excuse me, the absolute non corner formulas. Now, if you go back and check my publications, many of the publications are related to a little bit about this technique, but many are related to this technique how you can deal with the very large deformations, which are needed in modeling of cables, these belts. There are many different practical applications where that is needed. Okay, so I see I have 15 minutes left in today's lecture. So let me still see if you guys are here. I guess I have. 70 years. I'm not sure if I can read these numbers correctly, but it looks it's still there. So, methods. Now I'm going to spend next 15 minutes to shortly explain how are these methods. The first method, which is this lamp mass approach, it's not really even a family of flexible multibody dynamics. Why not? Because the theory is rigid multibody dynamics. The idea is very simple. And it goes such that you have original body, which typically is a beam-like body, like this. And then you divide your beam-like body to number of rigid bodies. So one body turned to be number of bodies. And what you're going to do then is that you will introduce the spring elements to all six degrees of freedom in a special case between the bodies. And these springs act as a deformable body, or the combination of rigid bodies and springs, they act like a deformable bodies. There is rigid multi-body dynamics because you're simply adding more components and you're adding more of this kind, you're adding more variables, you're adding more external applied forces because the springs will be treated as external applied forces. And that's about it. So it's very, very simple. Here are the few examples. Well, this shows like that how it goes, and it's capable to describe this, you know, if you would make a cantilever beam by using this structure, and if you have enough rigid bodies, and when you're loading the, the last body here like this, then this, this is actually moving not just downwards, but a little bit of axial direction as well. So it's capable to capture that. But theoretically, theoretic wise, this is very simple, and it's rigid, extension of rigid multibody dynamics. Okay. Examples, look at this. So these are the models uh, that uh, are no longer very fresh models. This one, I think, was made, I'm guessing just here. I think it was made um, 85, 1985. That's uh, a while ago. And this here's another model with approximately same age. 
it tells it, you know, based on the animation quality, quality of animation, you can figure it out that old stuff. The method is still used, and it's still used in some of the cable models. And now I have the voices coming to my headset, so it's a little bit annoying. So this is a meta, which we're gonna discuss a bit more on next Monday. So there is a tower crane and the cables, wire ups here in, in this um, tower crane. Those are modeled by using rigid bodies and springs between the rigid bodies. And it seems to work fairly realistically. And it's okay. And look at this. So it's uh, when this is lifting. Oh, yeah, even the, the taut string effect is accounted. And the taut string means that, you know, when you have viral blues, its frequency is different than it is pre tensioned The pre tension will increase the frequency. So this is the one way to model the cables. It's okay method. It's not perhaps the most sophisticated ones, but still okay. All right, so uh, here are a little bit of summary about this method. So method is computationally expensive. And computationally expensive because it includes number of unknowns. And easily the number of unknowns becomes to be very high, like it or not. And it can be applied mainly for beam-like structures. Material dumping is usually very simple, so it's hard to make it very accurate damping models. Easy to implement, simple theory. Another matter is that is making it computationally expensive is that it easily leads to a stiff or numerically stiff systems. Numerically stiff systems means that we are dealing with the system that includes low frequencies and high frequencies. And this is a combination that is very lethal. It is very hard to deal with in a computational dynamics. And simply that's because these high frequencies are slowing down the, the numerical time integration scheme. And they usually don't really matter that much. And you should try to get rid of them, but it's often very, very hard. We will get back to that in that course, which I mentioned earlier, this simulation laboratory course, that outstanding course. Okay. Finally, floating frame reference formulation. This is the one that you combining finite element model and multi-body system dynamics. And then you can model all kinds of structures. So it's not necessarily beam-like structures, but you can model whatever you want. Let me try to tune my pictures. So I don't get it like why it's not going to be more, it's okay. Okay, so what is the theory of this method? Well, this method goes such the way that you're modeling particle deformation with respect to coordinate system that is like, kind of like a little bit about um, body reference coordinate system. And it is a body reference coordinate system, but behaves slightly different the way that in the case of rigid bodies. Uh, you guys are getting excited that we're speaking about the particles again and particle rotations. So I, th I thought that we are done with that. I honestly thought that uh, we're never going to revisit the particle rotations. And here we are again. So uh, particle deformation, point deformation is modeled by using the vector U bar F. U bar F is the one that comes from the final element model. And the final element model, the deformation is described with respect to this coordinate system, the body reference coordinate system. This coordinate system is called floating frame, floating frame, because it is traveling with the body, but it's not necessarily attached to the material point. And this is really, really confusing. Like, what is it or is it not? And the answer is yes and no. Okay, but I don't want to go deeper in that theory because um, it's not nasty, but it takes a while to explain it out. So um, not today, another time perhaps. Uh, so now this guy is with the U bar F that is coming from the finite element model. And here's a not so. So this is kind of like a summary. What happens? in the floating frame reference formulation. So 
with u bar f, this guy is modeled in a final element model. And then reference motion, which is this guy here, that is coming from multi-body system dynamics. So this is what makes it possible to describe deformation of any kind of system you want, anything you want. No limitation, really, except the large deformation, of course. But other than that, you can do whatever you want. Uh, now, the problem in the method, if it is being used, like shown here, is a typical finite term model consists of very high number of degrees of freedom. You can easily find a finite term model with a million degrees of freedom, 10 million degrees of freedom, 100,000 degrees of freedom, that's typical. 10,000 is considered as a small model. But that's a problem because this one here, we usually don't deal with that many variables. We're dealing with a low number of variables, say um, 20 bodies, 20 bodies less than even 20 bodies, that multiplied by six is um, say 150 variables max. That versus 10,000, things are not really matching. So we have to do something to this final term model. Now what we're gonna do for the final term model is a method that is called modal reduction, means we're reducing the model size. How? Well, we simply gonna manipulate our final term model such the way that we're gonna look at what are the deformable modes of the entire structure. Of course, I know that you cannot get the grip up with this idea this time, but this is for later readings or for your general information. We're kind of looking at what are the, the ways the entire final term structure behaves. And this is what we're gonna to use to reduce the size of the model. So we basically, what well, we can do that in many ways, but we can, we can compute the natural frequencies and corresponding deformation modes. And those are the ones we're using to reduce the size of our original finite term model. And then once we do that, then we can come down from 10,000 degrees of freedom to say 20 degrees of freedom, even less than that. And that's what it is possible to use this method such that is in an application of uh, real-time simulation. Yes, and this is what the use is open and is teaching. So model reduction is um, a little bit of a lengthy topic. Um, for sure, we are not gonna touch in this course, for sure not, because we're moving from one space to another space. And uh, these spaces are not all spaced, model space, nasty, lengthy stuff. But you will see already explained it to you, so no worries. And um, that's where we're gonna leave this topic. Examples. Here is a biomechanical example where this uh, lower limb is modeled. And as you can see here is uh, where the type and femur both are modeled as a flexible bodies. These two bodies are modeled as a flexible bodies, not because they're deforming so much. That's not really the reason to model them as a flexible bodies. But we wanna model them as a flexible bodies because we are interested about how are the strains, these guys? A little bit about the stresses, but mainly the strains in different exercises. Because the medical doctors would like to learn what kind of exercise makes it uh, bone to be the most stronger, or the, what is the kind of the exercise that is healthy for both, both strengthening perspective. And they know that based on the animal test, based on the athletics, that if certain amount of strains and strain rates is in both the bone, bone gets stronger. And now we need to know, okay, how is the different exercises affecting the bone strains and strain rates? And uh, that's gonna be possible practically only via simulation. You could theoretically measure this too, but then you need to strain gauge to attach to your skeleton. And uh, you don't want to do that, I can tell you. Maybe you can put it here in uh, tibia, but the femur for sure you cannot. You cannot. Uh, there's no way to measure how is uh, strains in close to hip region. 
And that's exactly what we would like to know because the hip region is the most critical region and you cannot measure it there. So how it performs is like this. So this is a simple sitting, standing up and walking exercise. This is what are the deformation modes, the ones that are these related to moral reduction, how they are used in this case. So this is um, Tibia, is one of the volunteers that is scanned by using MRI and CT. And uh, then uh, this is telling what are the deformation modes associated to Tibia bone. Just an example what the flexible multibody dynamics can do for you. And now that's it. So 5.45. So we're done for today's lecture. Next uh, Monday, I'm going to have a different camera settings, although that this camera was working okay today. But I want to use this one. I want to use my GoPro. And then what else? Oh, yeah, and then I'm going to get the new headset. That's already in the a, in, in a mail. So I should have it in a Monday. Okay, Teams meeting. Yeah, Teams meeting. I haven't sent the link yet, so we'll do that momentarily. So uh, hold on. Where is my here? Hmm. Let me see. I need to go to my calendar. Oh yeah, here it is. So uh, it was last Monday. So the new now is 16th. 16th. So uh, check out your inbox and. Uh, Oh, hold on, I need to take this off. And see you in a second in a Teams meeting. So I'm going to close today's recording and streaming. And I'm, by the way, happy by myself. This is uh, the quality-wise significant improvement. Okay, so... Okay, so um, what else? I don't know what this is, so I don't know. So there's there's some kind of um, computer problem.